to get kids to uh, really, really learn about human rights, um, as well as in the context of critical pedagogy framework. So I do a lot of that in my class to get kids to really critically think about the world around them. That's how I incorporate the new chart in my English class. I can speak on that too. Um, we have some books that we're sort of required to teach as a department, and I teach 11th grade um, American literature. And so how do I make something like the crucible relevant to my students when the language to them it seems completely out of date? And the idea of witchcraft that sometimes my students are very literal, it's hard to connect um, persecution in general to something as specific as as witchcraft or communism, even, because they were born uh, after um, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, and so what I do is I, as we're reading this, this book, a lot of news articles, and then we, I bring in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and each of them will uh, choose a, a human rights violation that's taking place in the world currently that they're particularly interested in for, for whatever reason, and connect that to the document they do a, a research paper, and for many of them, it's like the longest research paper they've ever done, um, which I think is really good for them in terms of uh, their writing skills and everything. And then they do a presentation that involves a, uh, a poster component, a creative component, and um, of course the oral skills and, and all that kind of stuff. And so it really kind of approaches the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from a multifaceted way, and they get to learn all about different violations that are taking place because the the one rule is that nobody's allowed to do the same topic, so everybody's got to be focused on something different. I teach English language development, and so my students need a lot of practice with speaking and writing, and so we, um, we do the curriculum that was provided by this um, institute last year. We did all the way through, and that involves research, but it involves a lot of personal writing. So for me, there was a lot of emphasis on personal writing, a lot of theater exercises to get them to come out of their shells. My students actually put on a culminating presentation much like the one you saw today um, as part of their first semester work. And they not only wrote it themselves and directed it and put music to it and did all of kind of the work that we've done over the past three days, but then they remixed it for a second showing a month later. And so all the students were able to kind of have a hand in, in writing and directing and putting it together. Anybody else have plans for what they're gonna do? Because we have return. <laughs> Um, students here at the institute, but anybody else that get inspired and have ideas of what they're going to do when they go back to their classrooms or wherever it is they're returning to after the institute? I am a scientist and a chemistry teacher, and uh, many times uh, students uh, of different disciplines uh, refuse to learn science. So uh, this uh, uh, the inspiration I get. Here is uh, all of this uh, um, encouragement in group, um, building community. I think they are very powerful. Like, and to define to define the own because once you define yourself like uh, empowered and uh, able to do something, they are going to be able to learn something. So it's your entry point. Teaching your science. Yeah, I'm a scientist too, and I agree with Mariana that um, I think science can be taught with kind of a creative, uh, in a creative way, a creative spin, and it may engage students a little better in terms of the material and their understanding of the material. That answer. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, this is awesome. So thank you. Um, I, I have a, a bit of a challenging question. I think that there's two sides to um, going about this work. One is teaching what and learning facts and knowledge, and the other is teaching how. Um, teaching what, I think, is very clear. Um, but teaching how remains elusive. So I'd love to hear from you. Um, any insights you have is just to teach how to pursue these ideals. And then create action out of knowledge. Yeah, so that, I actually run a human rights education program in New York City, and um, last year we had someone working with us who did theater and other exercises with the students, and it was so motivating for them. So when I talked to Sandy about this, I said, you know, we have to learn more about this and get it into our curriculum. But our 
program actually um, does a semester of learning what, and then they actually do that <coughs> to learn how to build their advocacy skills by doing a real campaign in New York City. So they'll go paint murals on the streets, they'll do performances in their school, they'll visit with their representatives, so they're actually learning what, and then they're learning how and actually doing it. <coughs> I recommend like getting the kids out and doing it. Um, hi, I'm Sue. Um, I'm a to graduate from the master's program in HRE, Human Rights Education here in USF. And um, I'm not a teacher in a classroom, but uh, before I came to this program, I was living in El Salvador for four years. And um, for the majority of the time there, I was facilitating solidarity delegations who came to the country. And probably about 70% of the groups that would come would be university students or high school students from the US or even just a group of friends who got together who maybe there was a connection, one of the friends volunteered there for a couple of years back, uh, years back and wanted to go back. Well, um, the itineraries would differ depending on the theme they wanted to focus on, but uh, UN, the UN uh, declarations, UDHR were involved in that. Um, the university and high school students a lot of times, uh, sometimes were a class that culminated with um, the delegation in El Salvador in the summer, or um, if they were from a student organization, preceded the trip with like activities together with, at home. And then, um, so when they would come to El Salvador, El Salvador is like the backdrop, the history of El Salvador, the personal story, and the current situation there. And um, while they're there, they talk about human rights. They talk about what does it mean to be in solidarity with uh, the Salvadoran people? What does it also mean for US citizens you know, depending on your own background, how can you become an advocate for human rights? Um, if it's, you know, and uh, I, I found that's, from that experience, what inspired me to come to this program. So this experience has been amazing to get new ideas, meet people who are like-minded, and um, I, I feel personal sensory, sensory experience where you actually engage with people and who are going through a lot of different challenges and relating to human rights issues um, helps a lot. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a different type of, I guess it's not the classroom experience, but it's, both of them are just as impactful, I think, both types of environments. Okay. Uh, I have a couple ideas, but I just wonder, how many of you are teachers out there? Okay, great. <laughs> not many viewers, if you ask. Uh, two things, one is uh, this uh, program, I think, wisely put together to in performance. Okay, because it does two things. One is it makes us use our voice, which a lot of human rights are denied because people are going. Um, and it makes people stretch and grow. I think we all felt stretched, you know, while we're here to be bigger, say things more. And that's so important for being an activist. The other thing is that we had to work together. So we're so different. We all, by the end, felt very close to each other. And there was a lot of understanding. We felt like very different. So that's really, really important in the group work. Um, and then I want to give props to Sarah here because she was modeling like human rights teaching. Yeah. You know, she. Yeah. she yeah. And then, uh, if something would come up, if you know a student brought up an issue, she addressed it. She said, hey, "Man, we don't have time to talk about your homies who are, you know, died this week." We took a moment, you know, to have those things. So she brought the material that came in. The so I think how the teacher is, it's demonstrating what does it mean to live in that other world that we're hoping to get to. And I think, um, and I wish you so much, thank you for what you just shared. Because to me as a, as a performing arts teacher, a lot, a lot of people ask, well, you know, what's the next step? And partly the performance, the embodiment, the understanding of the embodiment of the work is, a piece of the how. Because if we can embody, if we can practice with our voices and our bodies what we're saying, and we practice it inside our groups, um, connecting with each other and reaching across difference to talk about what it is that we're passionate about, to me that's that's actually part of the how. And then, then everybody has their different interests of how they would be active in the world, but it's how do you bring yourself into the world? Are you, are you present? really present in your body, in your mind, in your spirit, when you're doing whatever it is that you're doing? And do you have an experience of, of participating in an activity that requires you to live 
in your body what it is that you're saying that you believe in. I think that's you know what I completely over and over reinforce with my students is how do you support one another, not be in, in fierce competition, maybe a little friendly competition with each other, but not fierce competition. How do you live it through the creation of the work? And then do your individual projects with that kind of experience in your body. I think that's some of it. And you know, because as a performing artist, I'm like, that's partly my activism is being an artist and creating work that people can connect to that then inspires them to continue whatever work they're doing. So that's that's an activist stance as well. You know, I know it's, it's actually about one o'clock, but I, and before we close, I so we're, and we are going to spend the rest of the afternoon actually working on next steps uh, for bringing this forward. But I'd like to welcome Professor Shabnan, and please, I don't want to say your name. <laughs> please come up. I, I want to welcome um, Shabnan to speak on behalf of USF because she is the current chair of the International. <laughs> There's really not a whole lot I can say after that. <laughs> so I should, I should just let us leave with this sense of inspiration and hope that um, was created right here on stage in these past three days. And um, you know, just on behalf of the International Multicultural Education Program and the School of Education, I just want to convey a heartfelt thanks to all the participants and Sandy and all our mentors. Um, for being here and for really kind of changing the feel of this place at least for a few days. And when we're in our classrooms dealing with a lot of content, you know, students often say, so what can we do? That same question, you know, so we're learning about all these things and we're inspired and we're disheartened and there's, you know, hopelessness and so how, you know, what can we actually do? And I think what was created here was such a concrete example of what we can do. And I appreciate what you just said, Sarah, which is, you know, in this process um, of kind of being and just being very explicit about what we're trying to do, I think we create a lot of kind of action ideas. But I also wanted to kind of go back to what Sandy mentioned earlier, which is that, uh, you know, I really feel it's about shifting the frame under which we function. And somehow over time we've become really effective at you know, functioning within this social contest frame, which is, you know, me versus you, and who can do better, and let's see, you know. Um, and kind of changing that to frame, to function within a more collaborative frame, you know, one with cooperation and so on, um, is really, I think, where um, the challenge is, and where hope lies. And I, I feel like you really demonstrated that in your act, and working with each other, and just, all I kept thinking is if they've done this in three days, just imagine what they'll do in a lifetime, you know? And, and that is, we have yet to see that. And I think the ri ripple effects, you know, each one of us going back to our communities from what we learn and the ripple effect that that will have is really where hope comes from. And I'm so excited to see what will happen, you know? So please let us know to the outcomes of, um, these training programs, and again, just a heartfelt thanks to everyone, and especially Sandy, who, you know, just kind of spearheads this. <laughs> we are, um, we're going to move over to down the hall to have some lunch, and then get ready for our next afternoon session, I, uh, I am so appreciative to those of you who are audience. Uh, well, you're welcome to join us down the hall while we kind of get our lunch and there, I think there may be enough food. You can, you're welcome to join in a little, talk to folks and we'll be resuming at two. Uh, but our lunch will be down the hall and I'll, I'll have some of our newsletters and annual reports if you want anything. So I'll come down and mingle with you. And I just want to thank you again for taking part. And kudos to our this wonderful group that uh, <laughs>